Hello, Pod Smashes of the Internet, and welcome to another episode of ADP Pod Smash. But now you just sound like an old man. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> we are where yeah. gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts. Penguin and Termite, I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. Yes, and as you can tell, we are both struggling to, well, I, maybe you can't tell, but as I indicated with that, we are both running on fumes right now. It's Memorial Day when we're recording this, and we have to record two episodes in a row due to travels of Termite this holiday, holiday this, this uh, summer. And mm-hmm. so we're going to we're going to bring it with everything we got, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, we're going to just know in the background we're powering through here. So uh, hopefully, hopefully this all comes together. Normally, we are where gaming goes to grab a beer. But as I mentioned, it's Memorial Day and I had like three beers today and I'm feeling like I, I literally the beer, I think, counteracted my Adderall. And I ended up just napping like, wow. like cat napping That's big this afternoon you. after like family left. Yeah, it was nuts. Mm. So I'm here. I am drinking coffee but I don't know, like, it's just like Aldi coffee, so I don't really have much to bring to the table there. But if you want gotcha. to talk about what you're drinking. I have nothing. I have not a single glass or liquid around me. We had a bur- a birthday pool party for my son, who's turning seven tomorrow, and I spent the entire day outside chasing the two-year-old around so that my wife could make her- the cake and prep. We had this whole pool party planned, and she made... I'll share some pictures of it. It's pretty cool. It's... A massive like charcuterie board, but instead of charcuterie, kids don't do that. It's all like fruits. So strawberries, bananas, blueberries, graham crackers with Teddy Grahams that are floating on like gummy rings and and, like umbrellas and beach umbrellas. So it was supposed to be like this whole snack tray. So she had to prep all that and she made a cake with Sonic the Hedgehog on it that I definitely will share on social media because it's pretty sweet. And she did it all from scratch and by hand, but it required yesterday and all day today. So I was running all of the errands to the grocery store. I was chasing the two-year-old around outside and keeping him entertained the entirety of the day. And then when that was done at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm already wiped. The pool party begins where (laughs) our entire neighborhood's up at the pool. And it was amazing. We had a blast. It was awesome. I brought a 12 pack of a session IPA and none of them survived. They're all gone, including the ones that I drank. And so like you, I did some day drinking today and I just got nothing. Being out in the sun all day, chasing children around, all the cleanup, I'm done. So yeah, we ordered Domino's for pizza and it was like, or for dinner. And it was everything that I could to even like eat dinner. (laughs) So yeah, I hate that, that feeling, but uh, so yeah here i am that's that was my here. drinking hey, story here. so that's what's yep. important right we're here. we're here for our audience we bring it for y'all we're here for our listen yes for our listeners for sure well so we don't really have anything to say for ourselves about beer so let's just is there anything you want to talk about before we start yes anything on your mind? i do have oh, yes, you do you have a tidbit things. of uh some fun like random not, yeah i guess kind of random where where i am living the daughter of the CFO of Zetamax. Her name is Cindy Talent. You can look her up. She's publicly known. Uh, I think she might be the executive vice president of Zetamax. And they, if you know, are a parent company to Bethesda and id. And Microsoft acquired them through that massive acquisition. So I talked to the CFO of essentially the parent company of Bethesda. It was next level. I tried everything I could to be cool and not just fanboy and act like a moron, a uh, blubbering idiot. I also was trying not to hawk our podcast in our show and like go crazy to ask her a bunch of questions. But as we discussed various things, um, she gauged the conversation. It was really cool. I was wearing a PlayStation shirt and she was, that's how the whole conversation even started. I had never seen this woman before in my life. I had no clue who she was. And she was like, Oh yeah, I like your shirt. Do you, do you play video games? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I've been playing games my whole life and you know, I host like this small little video game podcast. So yeah, I'm very much into games. And that to me is kind of an introduction because some people are like, they see a PlayStation shirt and they're like, oh, you play, this is perfect content for the show episode and the series that we're doing right now, by the way, like the whole non-gamer talk, right? So I yeah, right. assume she's a non-gamer because she's an older woman. And this is why you don't ever assume someone's a non-gamer. Yeah. It actually, it was not toxic. It was nothing wrong with it. But it's there's there's a way to approach that conversation that's bad. This was not that. Uh, but she asked me my my shirt, and I was like, yeah. But I feel the need to like establish credibility. It, I'm not just a gamer. Like I'm really into. I'm an enthusiast here. Uh, I have a collection. I have a podcast. I'm really into the industry. So I expressed that, and 
we got to chat uh, chatting and then she was like yeah i'm the cfo uh and i was like what uh so you know todd howard and pete hines from bethesda she's like yeah yeah i was with todd howard last week actually in miami and she <laughs> pulls crazy. out her phone and she shows me a picture of her and todd howard and my he's like he's a great man he's married he's got two kids uh he's a wonderful person he's super easy to get along with he's very laid back and i was like whoa so to cut this whole thing short some tidbits that i got out of the conversation one of them was that microsoft and bethesda both companies uh, two things the in the acquisition microsoft's vision is to take it extraordinarily slow and to let the studios have and preserve their culture as best as they can so microsoft's not coming in gutting cult like gutting the company getting rid of staff replacing it with microsoft staff and making all this changes and demanding things they're like nope we like these companies and their studios doing what they're doing best where they are now. That's why we want them. That's why we acquired them. And we want to let them do their thing. So Microsoft has a very hands-off approach to the creative process and their culture, which I think is awesome. The second tidbit of information when talking about uh, Activision, uh, she also spoke very negatively of Bobby Kotick, which I thought was very validating. It's like someone on the inside, right? Someone who's maybe actually struck deals with or had conversations with Bobby Kotick is sitting in front of me. And she did not speak well of him either in a professional sense, no character assassination or anything like that, but really like he's messing things up. And Microsoft really is as genuine as a company as they say they are. The we contrasted in our conversation we talked about EA and we talked about Ubisoft and we talked about Activision and kind of just how like each of them have fallen in some way in some facet of the industry and Microsoft isn't um, the, the stuff that we criticize Microsoft for in the gaming industry are stuff like where are all the first party games is game pass sustainable or like all these other questions about business, but the actual people are fine. Like they're happy. Working conditions are good. Microsoft is genuinely positive. Phil Spencer who talked to Cindy talent. Uh, she also knows Phil. So when I was talking to Cindy, she was talking about conversations, interactions with Phil. Uh, he is a gamer. She says that he plays online with friends and people all the time. And he's the head of Microsoft or head of Xbox. So um, yeah, it was very, very validating. I mean, it was awesome to like hear all this stuff. Now I don't, she's about to retire. So I don't think she had any stakes, any reason to like spin the thing PR wise. Like we're not this big, media conglomerate that has a media badge it's like at cameras and stuff she did let a thing slip about a game that is in development right now that i'm not going no. to talk about on the podcast just no. in case that can you tell me i later, can tell though? you offline yeah okay. yeah i'll tell you <laughs> offline but i'm not going to put it on the show so there is a, a game that's in development now and she like casually dropped it she's like oh yeah they're working on it. i'm like oh what <laughs> oh, rare, rare, and I didn't, rare. I didn't, oh man, yeah. you got the scoop, man. We could just be, you could become internet famous overnight, depending on what yeah, the game is. Yeah, but I want to protect like NDAs and embargoes, and like it's not public news, it's not out okay, there. Which did, means you did say her name, so I suppose right. that would yeah. be a bit I'm, of a. Yeah. I'm not that kind of journalist. You'd become internet famous, and then we would, then you would get your yeah. neighbor knocking on your door, being like, "What the f? You ruined my right. mom's like last <laughs> month of work." <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'll tell you offline what that is, and just we won't share it through so wait, pod smash but memes, I could but, sh like leak it and I could become internet famous but like not say but use my actual if I use my actual name then they couldn't trace it back to me right <laughs> hey <laughs> because, because nobody <laughs> on the podcast well I mean some people do my know it actually <laughs> That's yeah That's yep but she was a delightful person she was absolutely wonderful oh i did oh i guess another little kind of fun take was i mentioned that i enjoy fallout because she actually asked she was like do you like the elder scroll series and like fallout this was before i knew she was now i understand why she was asking specifically That's about those so funny but right. i was like yes i love and adore like i played through fallout 4 and then i loved fallout 76 Man, so good then, you were there not me because i'd have been like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you'd have been like Arr. oh but again before i even knew who she was it's like oh, walking around with a stick up your butt that's what it is <laughs> why do you hate my stuff but yeah, <laughs> yeah so before i even knew who she was at all like she was like fallout 76 didn't really didn't really launch that well and i was like yeah it was kind of you know it was she's really, probably really thinking rough. the exact spreadsheets she saw that were like disheartening because she's cfo right right I'm not yeah. saying that she doesn't play the games but like her primary method of engaging with these games is if you know valuation right yep. so uh yeah she's probably like yeah oh, and yeah, so it's like that yeah, i put like 80 hours 
<laughs> yeah, probably. But it was fun. Like she was honest. Like even before I even knew who she was, she was honest about like, yeah, Fallout seventy six didn't do very well when it first came out. And I was like, yeah, they've done such a good job, like shaping it, shoring it up, and making it better. I spent like eighty hours in the game. I loved it. And then went on to discuss about like playing with friends and how like the online experience is what kept that alive. And yeah, that's, I'll that's say it. this: the most recent Bethesda published game that I enjoy have been enjoying. Uh, Ghostwire Tokyo is great. I, I, I'm genuinely enjoying Ghostwire Tokyo, by the way. I, I started that up and grabbed it on sale. It was on sale for yeah. like 40 bucks, I think. And uh, it feels more like Doom than Fallout, right? As far as the, the first person controls go. Okay. And, so it's uh, like that. I yeah, wonder yeah, if, well, it's Arcane. So they did. No, it's, Dishonored. um, no, it's Dishonored Tango Arcane? Works. Tango Works. Oh. The the peppy Asian girl, but she then left the project. But right. she was, it was that studio. They did Evil Within. That's what it is. They did the Evil Within and Evil Within Two. Oh, yeah. Yes. So it's good. It's like it's so. I mean, I can see where the reviews, like why it got the poor reviews it did so far. Even just a few hours into the game, I can see how some of the stuff might be a little repetitive uh, in the open world stuff. But like, I guess I don't mind that so much. It reminds me of Dishonored. Actually, is what a no, not Dishonored. Infamous. Infamous Second Son. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of that, where it's like it is a lot of like repetitive open world activities, but I don't mind that so much so it's fun i like it it's, it's good but it just made me think because i was like oh yeah i'm, I'm like actively playing a bethesda published game. i mean they didn't make it but zenimax still probably profits off of the work of uh the subsidiaries of bethesda as well i imagine so it all kind of mm-hmm. flows upstream so ah uh-huh. well, i'm gonna find a talk i wish i was there you should have just pulled me up on the phone and then i could have handled i could have been <laughs> I was crazy trying not one. to be no no that <laughs> Like, he's trying to be very cool and, like, not freak out and make they this about... They probably adore the fan. And they, she probably would, like, have loved that you recognize that she is a part of that machine as well, even though she's the CFO, right? Like, I don't know. I, I uh, She's far enough removed from the actual developers that I doubt most people actually fanboy on her. Mm. Ah, yeah, that's whatever. true. I, mean, Maybe, yeah. uh, who knows? I did a little hot wash conversation with her daughter uh, who lives in our neighborhood today because I talked to Cindy yesterday. So today I was like, yeah. it was wonderful mm-hmm. to talk to your mom. She was awesome, delightful person to talk to. And I tried as hard as I could not to fanboy all over. And she's like, you know, she doesn't really run into a lot of people who really know her job. And when she does find someone, it's she loves it. And I was like, oh, well, there you yeah. Go. That's what I'm so you're yeah. you kind of right. Like that hunch of you know, being a CFO. Well, now she doesn't back wear the, you know, the say anyway. to the daughter. Hey, by the way, if she's open to it, we it would be really cool to interview her on the podcast. Yeah, she might. Who knows? Yeah. That would be a that would be a pretty big. I will uh, write a letter, <laughs> or at least like get us a an inside backstage pass to like a Bethesda tour in Rockville, Maryland. We can drive up there and like meet Todd and talk about our tiny little podcast and like I'm meet the studio and like see it. I am. Dying. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. No, that'd be yeah. incredible. I mean. Yep. That doesn't sound too far out of the realm of possibility. All right. Well, right. we yeah. don't have time to to fanboy all over it, and we're going to go ahead and skip favorite things. Yeah, that was clearly sounds it. like a favorite <laughs> thing, right? And yeah. I, I'm vicariously favorite thinging on that. So so we'll skip favorite things, and we'll move on to our last only, or only segment in this case before our main topic, which is we didn't even talk about <laughs> what topic we're talking today. Man. We haven't yet, did we? Yeah. No, we didn't. And so we just, you guys will be surprised, or you can just look at the title on your uh, phone app because we'll yeah. have it. We are out of it. Okay. <laughs> DLC. Uh, DLC stands for downloadable content. It is a segment of our show where we have a fun little game, a fun little sub mini discussion. It's a conversation you wouldn't normally have about video games I like to say. I uh, and so um okay tonight the, the DLC doesn't always have to do with our main topic sometimes it's a complete side conversation a complete diversion but in this case it does tonight we are continuing our non-gamer series I call it it's uh it's meant to be a defense of games I guess to non-gamers but not in a ways with which to convince people to become gamers instead it's to convince people who are not identifying as gamers to try give games a try right so tonight we're specifically focusing on what does it look like to then learn where does one start where does one begin and so it's sort of a a mix we're going to be talking about both the teaching side of games and the learning side of games so this dlc was a fun idea i came up with along the lines of teaching so let's say let's say in the future gaming is such a ubiquitous part of culture that like we hope and dream it is now something that is taught in universities and you Termite and Penguin, uh, you and I, Termite and Penguin, are are 
old fogies with big gray beards and we walk around with canes, but we are the esteemed professors of gaming for a uh, Ivy League university. Ooh. What classes do we teach? What Sorry, what class do we teach together and what classes do we teach individually? Ooh, this is fun. Okay, so yeah. first off, we have to start every single class with stay a while and listen. <laughs> stay a while and listen. We don't start yeah. it with brr, 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 Yeah. And that is a reference for those who don't know what we're talking about. Diablo, Diablo 1 was a famous Blizzard PC game back in the ni- late 90s. And it took, it, it's culturally relevant. It's kind of an inside, inside joke, if you will. But also like everyone, it's memed a lot. It's a big deal. So stay a while and listen. It's Deckard Kane. He's an old man in the center village of the hub world. Yeah. And you talk to him for a lot of things in the game. And one of his quotable quotes is stay a while and listen. And uh, it's yes. great. Yeah. Do we take back the approach? Back in Roger. Yeah, yeah. Back in my day. No, it's like a serious to... thing. This is like a serious. This is like this. They are getting okay. credits for these classes. You know, okay. like this is that well regarded. It's like so cinema there's... is now. Right. So. Okay. There's already game design classes and curriculums. No, no, no. And this is about degrees. like this is about like gaming, I guess, culture. I mean, it could be the whole gamut, right? You could be teaching about like the industry history. You could be teaching about the artistry. You could be teaching about the. I mean, I know I could just say I would probably be teaching like game literature, right? <laughs> like video games <laughs> as literature. Yeah, would probably be my strength, my forte there. And have a whole syllabus breaking it down by like theme, character. How does how do video games draw from the the greats, right? Like how do video games connect to the wider world of literature? That would be one because that's like my quote area of expertise, so to speak. So I, I imagine that you know I'm spitballing here because we're not talking about game design. It would probably be more like you would teach like the history of game marketing, yeah, you nailed or the it. history just of about game. to yep yeah uh, like the gaming industry development possibly like what like it would uh, touch on know. a lot of things like my history course because it would be over the semester. It would be sort of economics, sort of business stuff, and it would also be innovation in like hardware. Um, so a little bit of electrical things. Uh, we, we want to dabble enough to where you can understand why what RAM is, it, but also yeah, yeah. industry trends. So then you get to like the macro level where you're like, oh, in the eighties, arcade experiences were they were trying to replicate that at home. And so like game design changed and then you like that kind of stuff and, and get into the nitty gritty through the nineties and like the home consoles and the arcade spaces and how it morphed. And then a huge, I would I almost imagine like you now be like, I am I know I'm I know you kids will find this funny because you're all sitting on phones that have a petabyte yep. or two of storage. <laughs> but back in our day, your Game Boys <laughs> kilobytes. had kilobytes worth of storage. Yeah. 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 So I would take deep joy in walking people through the history of game design, video games, the gaming industry. And I could even have different courses with different aspects to cater it to specific stuff so it'd be really really cool to like team up with the economics wing of the school for those that are doing economics majors and then those who are doing business majors and like partner with them to get the knowledge that i don't have to make this kind of course like creditable for their curriculum so that they could take me as an elective so i'd be looking in that way where i could like web nice. into the academia it'd be awesome stop <laughs> making me think of retirement plans because i'm like about to make this for real what it's awesome. uh what would we teach together Ooh, together. Like what co teach co together? teaching situation? Ooh, I've never had I a feel class like with two I, teachers. Have you? <laughs> no, no. But I, I know, know I've looks heard like. of them. Like I know that yeah. like that's a thing that I hear about. Where like two teachers have a really like solid. It would totally probably be an elective course. I feel like it would be something like game reviews, like how like how to analyze game reviews, but like his like also historical perspective but also with the idea of like how to like identify different biases in game reviews right like so how how do you identify like when someone's reviewing a game how can you parse out what they actually want out of the experience in order to best like I feel like we're pretty good at that, right? Like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, like you can tell this review is like, oh, they really don't care about puzzles at all. And so, of course, they were turned off by the puzzle experience. They're probably someone who wants like a moment to moment action experience. Right. And so like that kind of thing is like, I mean, we don't necessarily actively talk like that on the show, but like I still feel like you and I are pretty good. But we're, well, we're definitely good at identifying that in ourselves. Right. Like in yeah. ourselves and each other. We're like, yeah, you know, I can see how this is good, but it's just not for me. Right. 
like mm-hmm. that i feel like we'd be, we'd be good at um and probably is like where both of our strengths line up <laughs> is like evaluating yeah. games so i feel like it'd have to be something about reviewing games which is or almost like a like, journalism kind of approach right discussion yeah, uh-huh. it's adjacent to literary critical interpretation of video yeah, games yeah because and it's, it's like, like it's almost like it's like uh, evaluating primary sources right like yep. you probably that would probably be in a journalist class but like if you especially if you're looking at a historical perspective like all of the reviews that we roll our eyes at these days they're gonna be like historical documents at some point right because people will yep. go back and look at them and be like what did people think about this at the time and I mean, they already do that, right? Like, we already go back and, like, look at IGN's Demon Souls review to realize that, like, IGN was actually, like, ahead of their time and <laughs> how they evaluate, mm-hmm. right? So we do that kind of stuff all the time. We do that kind of stuff all the time already. I mean, the industry, but or the, the culture, I should say. But I feel like that's going to be, like, yeah, par for the course in, like, 25 years is going to be, like, yep, that's... I like it. All right, well, yeah, cool. Well, that is uh, DLC then. So now DLC. we're talking about... We're talking about teaching games from the perspective of someone who is trying to get someone else into gaming. We're also talking about learning games for the some, for the person who may be taking the agency themselves to try to learn games. But again, we call this the non-gamer series. Let's recap. Uh, in episode one, we took some time to define what a like gamer is. And as we agreed upon, a, a gamer is just someone who identifies as a gamer, right? Like gamer is like a, uh, I think gamer was like a moniker that was given to us by people outside of our circles but all gamers i think just sort of started as people who liked games and then people were like you're a gamer and then that became something like yeah i am a gamer right but at the end of the day like you could play games every day and if you don't identify as a gamer as far as i'm concerned you're not a gamer right like it's like a certain set of behaviors that don't make you a gamer but you're more likely to identify as a gamer i think if you do those things but all things considered like if you don't want to be called a gamer then you're not a gamer as far as i'm concerned but no matter what your behaviors actually are. So yeah, like in in the same way, when we quote label people non-gamers, that again is not meant to be a like a derogatory, like a non-gamers. It's really just like a, a, a vast category of people out there that just don't do that. So um, we'll talk more about that in a second. We'll elaborate more on that. But uh, you know, other things we covered, you know, are, in our first episode, the, the foundation of this entire series was meant to be like, what are reasons to get into gaming? So do you want to recap some of the things we talked about last week? Sure. Yeah. And oh, well, to piggyback off of the gamer identification, if you will, we're, we just like the gist of it was we had, we leave that decision on the person themselves. They can decide whether they're going to be considered a gamer or not. And the yeah. way that you had mm-hmm. said it almost made it look like we're not going to call you a gamer. No, we're oh, going right, to right. let you call yourself a gamer. You audience, individual person listening to the show. If you are considering yeah. yourself a gamer, then yes. And it doesn't matter what that looks like. You could play one match three game on your cell phone and say, I'm a gamer and we're right here with you. Let's go like you're a gamer. Yep, absolutely. Uh, or yep. you could be <laughs> yeah. you know, someone who sinks 80 hours a week into a gamer uh, now. games of service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I wanted to caveat, yeah, yeah, sure, clarify sure. that. Point. Right, yeah. right. Well, yeah, so yeah, what yeah, did exactly. we talk about last week? What were the reasons to get into games? I don't have the notes up from last week. I have <laughs> the notes up for this week, so I'm going to bring we those talked up. About some, yeah. Well, so like we talked about how there are some, you know, there, there are some basic utilitarian reasons, right? Like there are skills and stuff that video games can teach you everything from like, Yes, the studies are true. Hand-eye coordination does improve when you play video games. It might seem like a small thing, but there are certain lines of work where that's crucial, right? Or certain lines of, uh, or certain skills that you may want to do. It's not the only thing that can increase hand-eye coordination, but it's a really, really dang good one when it's something as compelling as video games, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, you know, things like connection, community are, are, are reasons to get into it. They're not, they aren't the sole reason. Like if you're feeling pressured by your community to get into it, then you shouldn't do it. But if you want a deeper connection with people like you can find that in playing games with them. And then also we talked about things like how, you know, the more people that get into video games, the more likely there will be to to make better experiences. We'll actually talk about that in more depth in our part three. And then uh, there was one more trying to remember what the last quality, whatever. Oh, yeah, they're good. They're getting better. Like whatever your preconceived notions of video games are, um, they're probably wrong. (laughs) <laughs> because yeah. because for every game that you would point out and be like oh vi- all video games are just this i you termite and i could sit here and be like actually no there's this 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 experience you tell me an experience out there you want to have that you would like to have in a video game oh i wish games were more just like uh like almost like uh, i wish they weren't so action-based and they were more cerebral and like solving 
mysteries and crimes with lots of drama. Yeah, uh, they got that. So many, yes. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, LA I, it makes sense. There, like, boom, right off the three yeah, decades, exactly. like the seventies, eighties, and nineties are were all like other than the computer space doing crazy cool things with RPGs and Dungeons and Dragons related content. But like the mainstream gaming outlets were like arcade experiences that were kind of cheap. They were used to get quarters out of your pockets and they were marketed towards teenage boys. They're usually loud electricity and hard rock. And when you're the older, I hate to generalize like generational things because there's so much sure. nuance here, but there's a general vibe of like, Oh, you play video games. That's kind of a waste of time. They're not really meaningful, but they say that because they've only known games through the first three or four decades of gaming where we have taken now a massive leap and t- change into what storytelling can look like and, and such. So that yeah, was last exactly week. So go that hang out week, there. Right. <laughs> if Absolutely, you did not yeah. listen to last week, you don't got a bail right now. Uh, you heard your little synopsis. You can hang out with us for this series. I don't want to discourage anyone from like, well, I'm skipping this episode until I get caught up. Don't worry about it. Just hang exactly. out with us. You're here. You, like, and yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The whole point of this episode anyways, is let's say that you're sold. Let's just assume that you are sold on, you know, starting your journey with games right like like playing games for the first time or, or trying to get into it maybe you've tried before and are now inspired to try again maybe it was because listening to that episode or you're listening to this episode because it caught your eyes like you don't have to listen to our reasons but let's just say that uh either our reasons or for other reasons you're convinced to give it a shot again that's what this episode is for yep and so but yes if you're interested in hearing i think again whether you have listened to it or not whether you're here because of that previous episode or not or whether you're just a listener of our podcast in general, it's still a good episode to go to listen back to. I think we got some, we had some pretty compelling reasons. So um, that people may not have thought of before. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start with that sort of quote assumption here. Uh, I guess it's not a quote assumption. It is a literal assumption. Um, but we're starting <laughs> with the idea of uh, that you are, that you for one reason or another want to learn how to play games, um, or you have someone in your life that wants to learn how to play games and you're trying to figure out how to teach them. We're going to try our best to figure out and talk about what does that look like to start. I want to circle back around to this idea of the labels, right? Because as I mentioned before, gamer as a label is actually a very small number of people because it only really encompasses the people that are like, I'm a gamer. There's like a much bigger category of people out there that are non gamers. And within that massive label that massive category there's probably a bunch of different levels of um non-gamers right people as far as their relationship to games go um i suppose there should be actually a seventh one in my list here and the seventh one is people for who whatever reason cannot play games they may be interested Mm, they may not be but they cannot so we'll call that level zero whether it's because of their economic situation or because of their parents or whatever there's probably a large family situation yeah Yeah, living status state whatever yeah yeah exactly so we'll just we'll say that that's category zero category one i listed is uh people who just have no interest or experience with games you know whether they Mm -hmm. have access to them or not they're just not interested and they don't have any experience um not to say that they're lost causes or anything we'll point them to that episode one was for them um (laughs) episode two is people who are interested uh in games but they don't have any prior experience i call that sort of the outside looking in group um Mm -hmm. there's the the group category three i call those the dabblers people who play occasionally maybe they play games on their phone or maybe they sort of dip in and play with their friends but they're not really big into it they have other interests etc etc Uh, Category four, I would say, are people who play games consistently but are just not into the gaming culture at large. You know, I think of this as the typical, like, uh, this is a super big stereotype, but I'll throw it out there anyways just because it's the first one that came to mind. But, like, the FIFA bro or the the Madden bro, they're literally getting on their... Yeah, they're literally getting on their Xbox every day, but they're just, you know, they're not paying attention to trends. They're not... They don't do what we kind of talk about all the time here on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, Category five, I call people, people who play games every day, people who have an interest in the gaming culture at large. But they just also have like a lot of other interests too, right? So it's kind of always competing for their time. And so not to say that they're not super into it, but they just, they're more like Renaissance folk, right? Where they're just like, they love games, they love the culture, but they're also just like, they would never identify as a gamer because they're like, but I'm so much more than that, right? Why would I pin myself down there? Mm. And then number six are people who are like, they are all of those things. They are basically everything that we are, but for whatever reason, they don't identify as gamers, right? And that could be for political reasons. It could be just they've been burned by gaming communities. And so they're just like, I just don't, I'm going to go as far as to not even identify 
but they do all of the behaviors that we do and more, right? It's still kind mm -hmm. of like the sort of like pinpoint of their life, focal point of their life. Like I would call those sort of category six. Um, I, I feel like there are plenty of people out. There's at least one out there, right? Like <laughs> I don't know that oh, person, yeah. but they, I, I am describing someone out there. So hopefully <laughs> someone resonates with that. Yes. So those are my kind of woke, my kind of uh, to break down the non-gamer label. Those are my six categories, seven categories, if you want to count category zero. Um, mm -hmm. So like I said, part one of this series of the non-gamer series that's for category one right people who don't have any interest or experience it's our attempt at convincing them otherwise um part three through six they are already playing games right like it's not too much of a stretch they already see even if it's just a dabbler they already yep. see the value so this episode is really for those category two people you bought our arguments you're in you want to play games but you don't know where to start so the first question I have then with all that information uh, front loaded, what are some good starting points and what are some different strategies to figure out what you are looking for when it comes to jumping into games for the first time? All right. Is that the first official question of our That's episode? The first... <laughs> I guess, right. yeah, technically, <laughs> what are the different interests? Like, what are the different interest levels of? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're good. Yeah. 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 But so what I love here is if you have, if you're interested in games and you've never and you're curious about how to get in something or someone has brought you that interest, go there first. That's your first step. Talk to the person who suggested something. Talk to whatever it was. If, if it was a YouTuber, like go look at more content from that YouTuber. If it was whatever coworker, go talk to your coworker. Um, because they obviously saw that something in your life, something in you and your personality that might enjoy a video game experience and they might have something in mind for you based on the fact that they know you. So there's no like objective game you should try. So that's like one good starting point. Uh, and if you don't want to do that and you want some strategies to figure out what you're looking for, uh, you could always Google like modern games for beginners and like just see oh, or yeah. like mm -hmm. most approachable video games and find what platform you have. I assume if you don't have a video game console in your house, you have a tablet or a PC or a laptop that can at least start with something. And services like Game Pass, Epic Game Store, Steam are two launchers you could run with PC games that they're free apps to install. And that's how you can get access to like the storefronts and you could start searching through games and their libraries. Uh, yeah. and once you do and your even search if you've got for, like, like a Mac, there's plenty of games. I believe Steam is compatible with Macs and there are games that you can mm -hmm. download that will say they're compatible with Mac or not. So they do make yep. it they try to make it, you know. If not easy, they at least try to make it there. They try to be transparent about whether a game yeah. will work on Mac or not. You might have mm -hmm. to do a little bit of like like I would I would definitely say start slow depending on what platforms you have right not every yep. platform is the same uh and not every platform obviously can play every game right so yep. and then that, again that you know we'll talk a little bit about assumptions that might not be something that everybody intuitively understands right right like exclusives platform even the idea of platform exclusives might sound completely wild to someone on the outside looking in right yeah it's true wait you're saying like all my friends talk about god of war but i can't seem to download it on my tablet like people might laugh at that please don't like legitimately it's someone who is interested and you know a gentle you know like making fun of them is just going to drive them away so it's like right like yeah no like calmly explain like and without condescending condescension be like hey actually you know <laughs> that's, i understand why you might think that why you might have seen that you've probably seen streamers play it um actually there's a huge you know thing in the industry or where platform matters right it's and explain to them it's the same as you know that not all shows are available on netflix right that'd probably be the most approachable comparison oh i see i see there's exclusivity stuff so you're exactly right right like if not a person like everybody comes to games from some other experience right so mm -hmm. it, most often it's a person you're at a friend's house and that friend is playing games and you're like wow that looks fun or it could be a parent or it could be uh or it could be consequently your child uh or it could be um just like you said seeing things on youtube but like so go to that first source first and see what yep. is it about that that you like about it and then try to engage with people in that community careful with that that's a sort of warning right, right. because that is yeah. that there that can be fraught with its own pitfalls but in general try to find some source that you trust of information and look into it there but doing a little mm -hmm. bit of research too as to figuring out like okay what does this game run on like those are all good things to like be aware of on the front end because it can be a little complicated to navigate sometimes um, especially but if yeah all those four yeah yeah but i mean if you most... have a pc as most people do a laptop you can probably play a lot of games from steam right they may be older games but there are 
but that's the fun thing about technology is there are classic games, games that we would consider classics that are amazing experiences that run beautifully on like any laptop you grab off the shelf at Best Buy, right? Yep. Any game from 10 years ago is going to run great on anything at Best Buy, right? So mm-hmm. like, yeah, the games have been around long enough that like you have access probably to a lot of great games. And what I love about like going to your first source first, say you're like, you're watching a movie. It's like a zombie movie and your friend or whoever you're watching this movie with looks over and is like, oh, there's this video game. It's called Days Gone. You're going to, you would love, if you love this as much as I see that you love this, you're going to love Days Gone. You should go play yeah, that. Yeah. And then that's yeah. like a specific game on a specific platform that you can oh, easily just Oh, I forgot to grab. tell you, right yep. after our conversation about Reasons the Game where I had even mentioned that like the notion of like telling my mom or my dad like, oh my gosh, you'd love this video game. My dad came over that week that we recorded the episode. He comes back. He, he, he comes over like after the kids go to bed, uh, he's staying the night and he was like, hey, have you ever heard of Uncharted? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, I assume you mean the movie. But yes, I've heard of the movie. And yes. Hey, guess what, dad? It's based off a video game. If you like the movie, you might actually like the game. That kind of thing, that kind of conversation. Now, I don't expect my dad to play Uncharted, but that's the kind of conversation we're talking about. Right. Hey, yep. if you liked X, you would love Y game. Right. Um, yep. I'll say that like, uh, but something to also kind of consider, you know, this is sort of a personality thing based on yourself. I would, I would do some introspection and ask yourself the question, do you want someone to teach you or not? Right. Because some people absolutely need someone to teach them, right. Need someone to walk through it with them. They need that like relational experience of like, you know, for lack of a better term, hand holding. Um, and I, and I, I hate that term only because it can be so like uh, uh, condescending. Um, no, but legitimately, it's just like they, they want that that the intimacy that comes with sort of someone teaching them something. They're more patient with it. Some people is that's infuriating. Stop. Right. It. Stop looking over my shoulder. Stop grabbing the control. Stop. Like and and so, yeah, it's just like depend, depending on your relationship and your personality. It's like kind of be aware of those. There, there are options you have that aren't having someone teach you. So like, yep. know, know thyself, right? To know yes. whether that's something you would even want to do. And there are, yeah. And then seek out, uh, you know, so there's tons of other methods, right? Of learning games. And honestly, many of us just learned by, because we were kids and had the attention span of, you know, doves and just like played <laughs> over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, the same games. And then that's how we learned, right? Because we had nothing else to do. So, yep. um, yeah. So cool. All right. Well then, yeah. So uh, speaking of doing things over and over and over again, until you get it right. (laughs) Uh, What are the fundamental basic skills that you think uh, a player, a newcomer needs to learn that are pretty much foundational to every single game? Okay. I know this question has a story from you in it. And that is from it takes two. And (laughs) that that it was a great experience because we both played it takes two with our wives who would not identify as gamers. Oh, I still need to finish it, man. I yeah, and it's a wonderful game. Elden Ring ruined that for us. (laughs) Not ruined it, but like Elden Ring got in the way. It was like, no, all I want to play is Elden Ring. And now months later, I'm like, oh gosh, how do I get my wife back into the habit of playing this game? Yeah, and then you got to catch up on story two. And uh-huh. We're, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, but and we're back what to I square, about, we're going to be back to square yeah. one on the controls, but. <laughs> we are. <laughs> yep. And what was great about It Takes Two is that it comes with a, a way that the second player can play for free with you. So if you're a gamer, you want it, you buy it, you can, I think there's a code in the box or you can send an invite to anyone who doesn't have the game and they can play with you. But if they're non-gamers, it the game itself, It Takes Two, crosses almost every genre that's out there throughout its story there's different moments there's third person shooting there's platforming in a 3d space there's dungeon crawling it's amazing in that regard and what it did was help us each you and i expose like our wives exposed their weaknesses in gaming to us like my wife was not so good at third person shooting but she was great at platforming and so these are the fundamentals Mm -hmm. of game this is the answer to the question here it's like what are the fundamental basic skills a player needs to learn that are foundational uh and we did this as children on side scrolling retro retro titles at least i did super nintendo and oh yeah yeah yeah. and we got exposed to i mean the same skills that i used to do dodge rolls time dodge rolls in dark souls it's the more or less i mean it's a little bit more complicated but it's more or less the same button presses and timing like brain triggers in battletoads right or in castlevania the, like mm-hmm. the og right it's just it's this it's it's all just the kind of reaction time that is instinctual to us and then we built on those that foundation you know castlevania the foundation that built that foundation built into like gold knife that built into smash 
that built all into uh and then mm-hmm. those all built into you know halo blah blah blah. Yeah, the, you go through the history of games right but like fundamental skill built on to another fundamental skill built into another one and then so now i can pick up a first person shooter and into it how to play it like without having anyone have to tell me more than mm-hmm. the basics of like okay which button is reload got it okay awesome yeah. thanks man right but i mean of i mean even more the... fundamental than that it's the controller right like yes whatever your controller method is you know whatever input whether it's a touch screen or uh you know an xbox controller like you need to get your hands on it and you need to get used to it and you need to like here's what i told my wife was you need to be able to know what button you're pushing without looking at the controller right like that because you know the games aren't designed for you to look down at the controller every time and right. though that's okay to do that right i'm not shaming anyone here like yeah. that is that is how you learn it right like and so you're gonna have to do that occasionally but but you know that that should be a skill you have in the back of your mind i need to be able to do this without looking Um, caveat in nintendo because the joy cons you can turn them sideways so the buttons aren't always on the top like uh x or y is not always on the top i can't remember which one's on the top because they switched it from xbox but so what they do and they show it on the gui with every single game any pop-up tutorial it it highlights which button to hit because if you do have like the d-pad turned sideways then suddenly what used to be right is now up. And so you can't say press up to go forward. So it just highlights the button kind of agnostic of what it actually is. It's great. So Nintendo Switch, if you're learning buttons, like that's a great platform to get into. But I think of all of the things with which gaming, foundational to gaming in general, is knowing what we learned in the 3D first-person shooters coming to consoles on controllers for the first time, and that was the N64, and then later with the PlayStation DualShock. But how to navigate with two joysticks, how to look around, and how to move the camera. And there's different options. You can do the invert thing, but whether you're playing a first-person shooter, a third-person shooter, a a 3D platformer, uh, an action-adventure game like Shadows of Mordor, if you're into Lord of the Rings, which is a great barrier. Even a lot of 2D games now, the twin stick idea, it's basically divorcing. It's what is it's ambidexterity, right? You're divorcing. You're doing one different thing with one hand and another different thing with another hand. That's not intuitive to everybody. Again, that it's once again, that's another you ever want to increase your ambidexterity, like play video games, right? Yeah. Like I had to, and I remember in my stage fighting training, we had a, a, a rapier and dagger class. And, uh, you know, that that is two one-handed weapons, right? And so many people had a hard time. They're like, you know, it's going to be hard for you to do the opposite thing, right? Because you're because you basically have to think like a left-handed person with half your body. And it was like, they're like, but you know, people who play video games are probably gonna have an easier time figuring it out than others because we're already used to doing that, right? Yeah. With, at least with yep. your fingers, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, no, that's definitely a huge thing. And it's, it is kind of different with each game too, right? Like to the way a left joystick works on a twin stick shooter is different than it is in a first person shooter is slightly different than it is in the way in a third person shooter, or sorry, third person mm-hmm. action platformer, right? It's but really, usually it is, there, there's a lot of commonality between the way the camera would work, looking at the person in third person and the first person shooter aspect. And that's why I say like those are they have a lot of overlap, like 90 percent of video games out there are going to derive from that sort of camera. If it's a 3D game, it's going to yeah, have if that. it's got a like, reticle, if it's got a reticle. Yeah. yeah. Or, or even. And not, so that's uh, the, the most foundational, fundamental thing to learn. And you can learn that from playing like Mario Odyssey on the Switch. You can also pick yep. up Uncharted and you can learn it there or like a Shadows of Mordor or a Tomb Raider or God of War. I mean, there's a million Horizon Zero Dawn, like all of those games are all third person, first person mixed, whatever. And you can do the camera control and moving in the environment. Like with the two yeah. joysticks, only I mean, it and is jumping and stuff. I tell my wife, like whenever we drop into a game, whenever we drop into a game and she's playing, I say, take a second and figure out what each button does. Right. Like take a second and figure out how to move in this space and what movement feels like. Right. And and just give them a second to like do that. No consequence consequences. Right. Another <laughs> thing that I would recommend any non gamer or, or newcomer do the, you know, within the first couple play sessions is figure out how the menus work um not just the menu of the game itself but the menu of whatever operating system if you have a phone you already know how to operate your menus right but like if you're but if you're playing a game if you if you went ahead and just like i'm gonna get into gaming i'm gonna do it right rip the band-aid off i'm gonna buy a brand new console not gonna operate the same as your phone right like you need to know how to navigate the menus i would go ahead and just poke through the settings see what you like you never know what you'll find there um look through you know google pull up google and say what are the best console settings for new gamers and when you're playing a game for the first time what settings should i do if i'm new to games right 
uh, because some games are going to have more accessibility features than others, but like you'll be surprised how much those accessibility features can completely ease the experience. And most of them are turned off by default. And that's mm-hmm. because of certain assumptions that the developers make and that aren't necessarily wrong assumptions, but again, like, you know, for newcomers aren't always the very first person they have in mind. So you'd be surprised you play, you pull up a game, you play it for an hour without thinking about accessibility features. You're going to be like, Oh, screw this. This game sucks. When all you might've had to do was just change a couple of features in there. It could have completely changed your entire experience. Mm-hmm. We talk a lot about accessibility features in the podcast. And that is a reason why it's a fundamental, like I said, a fundamental thing, a fundamental basic skill that you should that should be on the forefront of your brain as a new gamer is all right i need to figure out how to customize this experience for myself so i need to know how to navigate the menus at the very basic level (laughs) Mm -hmm. yep cool are you good to let's uh yeah we got more we got a lot to cover in this uh there's a lot i want to talk about i was like going i was a little bit ambitious with this uh notes here so we talked about things that are like okay these are fundamental skills that apply to pretty much every game there's a language though with gaming this was again i want to see if i can find this video because this video is illuminating to me but there's there was a one of the videos that inspired this entire series was again i mentioned this in the first episode but there was a a guy who basically sat down and played games with his wife for the first time and he decided he wanted to do an experiment he gave her like 14 games and then he just let her play and didn't say anything at all he just watched and took notes and his notes were basically trying to figure out the things that she had trouble with that are not explained by the games themselves that are just sort of this shorthand that we have in the gaming culture that everybody sort of takes for granted so because there is there's a language and we'll talk about some of those things in a second but that's sort of the foundation to the next question which is what are the things that gamers or 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 people who play games regularly take for granted that are not necessarily intuitive to first timers or you know category two one or two non-gamers right um i would say it's again it's simple things it's simpler things than you might think and you might like nod your like nod your head or, or tilt your head and be like huh but things like, you know, basic ideas is like, what what is red? What does the color red mean to you in a video game? Like enemies, if you see a red circle of health. You see, right. Exactly. I was gonna say it's either like enemies or health. And those are two different things. A red circle yep. appears on the ground. How do you know if it's going to harm you or if it's going to heal you yep. uh, as as someone who has never played this game or any game before? Mm hmm. You know, sometimes developers will will telegraph that by have it like flashing, right? A flashing red circle. Someone might think, oh, I should probably get away from that. Mm-hmm. But and then the funny thing is, OK, well, what's the other color? Green, right? The other big color in gaming. What does green mean to you? Again, either health and healing or poison. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do you know which it is, right? Uh, I mean, there are tools developers can use that are like there are different color palettes of green that would maybe indicate one or the other. But again, that's not necessarily something that the developers should be assuming. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that he brought up was the idea of like the extended jump. Yep. you know the game might tell you press a to jump but not every game tells you press hold press and hold a to extend that jump again yeah we've all been playing platformers since mario right we yeah we know we know that because that was part of the game but we learned that we probably learned that through trial and error or our brother smacking us over the head and saying dude just hold the button down uh right? yep. like but like someone playing for the first time, it's like that that's not intuitive. And that's something my wife's having a hard time with with it takes two is she wants to when she does the double jump, she wants to hit a as fat or hit the, the jump button as fast as she can. And I'm like, wait, hold on. No, like you need to like, like wait, I can't even say half a second because it's less than that. It's like, mm-hmm. wait, like a quarter of a, or a third of a second. Uh, but that's confusing her. So it's just like just I try to tell her, watch your character. And when they reach the apex of their jump, then hit it again. And you'll yeah. extend the jump. But like that's not an intuitive skill. So what are some it's of those not- other ones that are things that are just we take for granted? Yeah, I go back to our previous question about looking around with the camera, like the inversion. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. it's not obvious that you can invert that. But some people just have different ways of approaching what the joystick is playing, whether it's like a thing attached to the back of the character's head. And so when you move it up and down, it like does the inversion thing or if it's like your face is the camera. And so you go up or down or like you're used to flying. Yeah. And so it's a whole thing. And that's not obvious. And walking through that process is, I was going to use the apex jump yes. as well. Cause that's not, I seen a lot of, of gamers like mess that up uh, with Mario in my history in the past, it, there's running involved in platforming and a lot of non gamers don't run. And so they can't make jumps. Yeah. And yeah. so it, uh, like they don't that know momentum how to sprint. Of like, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And so clicking they don't know the that, left they don't stick. Even, it's not even, they think that it's like, oh, it's a fixed movement, but like we have right. been playing forever. We're like, there's probably a sprint button somewhere around here. And that's one of the first things yeah. you try to find is the sprint. Yep. It's like the sprint. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. always like, find sprint, find dodge. And yeah, right. Yep. Uh, and block. Uh, the, uh, well, and you're talking about the camera a lot too. Like, I know intuitively when I'm playing a third person game, I can't always, you know, unless I'm doing one of those funky claw grips, which I don't, and I'm not going to demand that of anyone, right? But so because of that, I know there are certain times when I'm going to not be able to touch the joystick to adjust my camera angle because I'm hitting another button, right? Um, yep. So I n- sort of intuitively know when in between actions I can kind of t- tweak and adjust my camera. Well, again, it takes two. My wife is struggling because she's like, I like, I, I need to move my camera, right? Like, I need to move my camera to see what I'm doing. I'm like, just do it in between your jumps or whatever. And it's just like, that's not necessarily something that, is, you know, I can't just say that. Um, I, I mean, I can, but I'm not going to just say that. I'm going to try to think through and be like, okay, when do I do it? And it's literally, it is like, again, I can like see my hand just sort of instinctively like flick to the joystick and then back to the buttons, right? It's, it's, it really is muscle memory almost. And it's because of mm-hmm. years and years, it's like, that's not intuitive um, to first time gamers. I mean, and yeah, yep. all the, all the language, you know, the things like what, like, I don't, I, <laughs> unless you've been playing Mario your whole life, like jumping on an enemy's head is not going to be something that you think to try, right? Uh, yeah. The guy used the example, the guy in that video used the example of Doom. I think I mentioned this in the first episode too, where his wife saw a big cluster of like parasites around a console and she knew she had to kill the parasites. She didn't, she didn't have a history of doom. So she didn't walk up to it where it's where if you, she had walked up to it, it was that hit your X button to reach in and you pull the core out. No, she was like, okay, there's all these explosives around. I should just move. So she's actually like creatively solving problems, but it's just not the answer the developers had. So it's, it's very, yep. very interesting topic. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of like, ui related stuff that video games use now in general that have like waypoints markers mini maps and just knowing how to intuitively process all of that stuff while you're playing can we take that for granted because we've been doing this since like grand theft auto like it's right where some people are like wait can i pull up the thing again where do i go to find the tutorials and it's like buried in like three menus deep yeah yeah Yeah. yeah, that sucks because like again you and i are like oh okay cool i hit that to do that right yeah there's like a, a pulse mechanic right like kind of like the the one in horizon where you have the yep like, that oh, man does it too. overlay kind of yep, no, exactly well, yeah 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 but similar like, but uh, different yeah and granted my wife's not playing this but in ghostwire tokyo i was like oh that's so crucial to the gameplay i imagine a newcomer who may have forgotten that would have mm-hmm. like you have to then go bury to like dig into menus side but, note i hate that that drives me oh, nuts. Yeah? Like really? constantly having to spam <laughs> the thing that scans the environment or like a second sight, like the Witcher, the Witcher did 3. that too. Oh yeah, I was gonna oh, say the Witcher did that I too. Dr- yeah. drives me because I I feel like I have to constantly do that, but that's not how you are supposed to play. It. I digress. Uh, I don't like. No, it, but no, yeah, it is. A, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. we can move on unless you have another thing. No, that's, no, no. That's I think all that's I good. I mean, that's like I mean, there's so many. Like you guys, oh, I, in fact, that's sort of a prompt. I definitely want to hear from listeners as to what are those like, what are those little things that you've either like tried to teach someone before and realized that are like infuriatingly difficult to teach just because of how like intuitive it is to you but the other person doesn't get it like those are the things we're talking about here and i would definitely want to hear i want like a whole list of them that'd be awesome how great would it and easy how great would it be to compile that and then like send it to developers and be like these are all the things that you need to figure out <laughs> yeah so anyways we'll actually circle back around to that idea too okay cool so uh so this question uh, is for sort of those category four through six players right people who have someone in their life that they would love to play games with who's just not a gamer maybe they're interested maybe they love you maybe they're not but you've got to do the arduous task of teaching them games and you may sit down with them and find the first time you play smash bros together that the experience is not very fun Because they don't know how to do anything and therefore it's not the cute, you know, competitive little smash game that you have with your new girlfriend that you were imagining it to be because you're sitting there being like, no, no, hit it. No, gosh, come on. Right. Like, (laughs) (laughs) so this is the question for that. You have someone in your life. uh, You're suddenly frustrated. So the question I have for the termite is how would you go about like teaching a game to someone who is a category two non gamer? And what are the important strategies and methods that balance? skill reinforcement without overwhelming and burning out your pupil this is a great question i've done this a million times in my life over the years at work at home friend gatherings family stuff i always 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 ask before we sit down to even play hey well we're gonna play mario kart it's the newest one on the switch it's four players we're gonna race together 
do you want to know everything or do you kind of want to go in blind and let the game teach you what you should know? I've been playing for a while, so I, I know a lot. <laughs> so like I can teach you if you would like. Again, it goes back to what you had mentioned at the beginning of this episode where you want the person receiving the teaching to be as comfortable as possible. And some people do want handholding, some don't. And some want to just learn it on their own and some don't. And so figure that out. So like, might be like, to start send with a me the game a week in advance. Let me get my handle on it by myself. <laughs> yeah, some might. Come, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But for the most, like most of my interactions were always at like gatherings with oh, gamers yeah, and sure. non-gamers right. combined. And it's like, oh, you guys are all doing this. Let me jump in. Our dear friend, Mr. Hall was one of these people who jumped oh, in and played yes. Smash Bros. And he so was one awesome, of, though. He yeah. Was and cool, he actually like, well, he didn't, did, and he didn't want to learn, but he will always want right. to, he was always willing to play and have yep. fun anyways. Yeah. yeah. He's an example of someone that like didn't need to sit down and teach him the, how to do everything. And then I had some coworkers when I did a Smash gathering of some folks who'd never played Smash before and did want to know like, okay, what are all the buttons? What am I doing? And so I walked through, here's the A's attacks with the directions. Here's the B attacks with the directions. And the object is to not fall off. And like, you know, I went on. So I won't go here with that detail. So it was like a, a teaching moment before we even sat down in front of the game. Like, here's what Smash is. And so I've done all of those. And you have to talk to the person who is going to possibly receive your teaching, how they want to learn or what they want out of this experience. It, there's also like a, a social, I call it EQ, like emotional quotient number kind of vibe that you need to pick up from the, what is the context of the situation? Are, is it a bunch of people gathering together over drinks and you pull out like Nintendo switch sports and someone just wants to bowl? Or are you like with a group of in, enthusiasts who like want to play the latest first person shooter that comes out or like a land party with halo infinite drop. Like everyone's yeah, really or into it. Are like, you with your you know spouse who wants to like has sat you down and said, I want to play games in order to get closer with you. Right. There's an entirely yep. different way. All of those right. are entirely All of the, yeah, three entirely different, different yep. strategies. Yeah. And I would say that like, yeah, I mean that I think the, one of the things across all of them is that emotional intelligence, that EQ you're talking about, which is this idea of like, everybody has tells right like uh, nonverbal cues are a really big deal yes so i think you you had a really good method with your wife when she was struggling with something and it takes two i think you said you grabbed your phone you looked up trophies and just sort of like let her figure it out and you did it wasn't like a oh gosh i'm so bored i'm gonna get on my phone it was literally just like nope here i'm gonna let you have some space figure it out get comfortable with it and meanwhile, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm assuming your wife did not want you like holding her hand and Correct. getting over her yeah. shoulder and all that. So you're just like, cool, yeah. I'm going to get on my phone and just sort of like be neutral right now. I've had to learn. I mean, how I to, took like, the moment to explain what she should do. I mean, like she oh, gotcha. would die yeah. or something by like whatever and have no clue. And I'd be like this. And I would just vocalize your the object of this situation is to get your character from here. Do you see that thing on the wall? Shoot it. That lets me do my thing. And then. I got to a certain point. I'm like, okay, now you have to grapple here and like you'll swing on this thing. Like she liked that, but nothing else. Like I'm not grabbing the controller for her. I'm not getting frustrated. And then let the game and that's just the big do thing, its is job. Like, yeah. If you're going into it, I think one of the biggest, most important things uh, to teach games is you have to go into it knowing that it's probably not going to be fun for you. <laughs> like at all. Yeah. No, 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 that, that's not entirely true because people get fun out of different things. But like if you're going into it thinking that they're going to pick it up right away and you guys are going to have a roaring time, it's going to be like when you play with your buddies. It's not going to be that. So if you are going into it with that expectation, you're going to get frustrated. So it's best to go into it to start with the expectation. I would say the biggest strategy is to start with the expectation that it's not going to be fun. And the fun you're going to have is the experience that you have the positive experience you have bonding and trying to teach something new. That means mm -hmm. when you get frustrated, you have to not show it or you have to stop, right? Like if you're getting frustrated, it's probably best to stop. So if they're not understanding something or getting something or just not able to do something, be patient or say, Hey, stop. I'm going to give you space to figure it out. I'll explain yep. what you need to do. I'm going to give you space to figure it out. I'm going to go yep. to the bathroom or I'm going to go get a snack, right? Or I'm going to go look up the walkthrough and figure out where the trophies are. <laughs> right or even <laughs> like say like or or even say maybe, maybe that's what they need maybe <clears throat> they need to watch someone do it right say hey would it help to watch a video of this would it help to do that like right like instead of grabbing the controller out of their hand oh that's a terrible way to never do that right yeah, exactly never, never do that do right that, but that's so instinctive to, to a lot of us is here let me do it right let me just do it for you right but the minute you do that you're done you haven't taught them anything so like Maybe it's here. Do you want to watch someone else do it in the video and you follow along with the controller, right? Like some things, that's another great strategy is like being able to pull it up and let someone else walk them through it while still being able to like have their hands on the controller. It's hugely helpful. Yep. So yeah, those, 
I would say those are some uh, like sort of basic strategies and and teaching ideas where it's like you have to understand and not everybody's an intuitive teacher right, right. I, and i i think though i have some good teaching skills i think there's also like some things that i'm not that make me not a great teacher so like knowing yeah but i was gonna say like most of it boils down to expectations going in the first time i was I, the first time i wanted to play halo with my wife was a disaster and we stopped after we didn't even get through the yeah you know, the first the pillar of autumn we didn't even get oh, like wow. in to fight covenant i don't think we fought covenant like i literally think that because she was stuck and i wasn't in a good mindset to teach her so we just got frustrated and turned it off it, it was an awful terrible experience so having come from that to it takes two i've learned a lot since then and <laughs> since then it was a whole different thing a whole different approach and it started with me being like okay i, I know this is going to take her some time to get used to everything so i'm just going to be patient right and i'm going and if that and i'll like you said i'll explain it help her wrap her mind around it but then just let her give her the space to figure it out and just be chill right be chill the fun is getting to play a game with your wife period <laughs> or 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 and maybe it's not your wife maybe it's your kid maybe it's your parent maybe it's your your you know your best friend who just has never been into games mm-hmm. but it doesn't the, that intimacy is an important part and a part of protecting that intimacy is being chill (laughs) be chill or just do something else yeah (laughs) yeah and the number one thing to think to realize here is video games in general like playing them is easy and i say it's easy compared to like i'm gonna skateboard i'm gonna do a kickflip because i saw it on tv and it looks pretty cool doing going from like learning how to ride a skateboard to a kickflip takes hundreds and hundreds of hours of constantly doing the same thing over and over again and failing it's absolutely miserable and a huge commitment Going from couch to I'm going to play Mario or even Borderlands is way faster, like it way is. more approachable. You're, You're like going to start playing games to, now. I, I going meant from like couch I, to couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going from nothing to some video game, you're usually going to pick things up immediately. And within yep. the first session, you will have learned a lot going from about uh, it. going from new couch to <laughs> cheeto cheeto stained and fart oh gosh you are couch <laughs> loving that stereotype but like to learn to play a guitar like think about all the chords and the amount of practice and like learning the language of music and all that it's no, you're so right. much it's, it's a just, huge it's, commitment yeah. it's like a big deal but to pick up a video game you got you can do it in one session whether it's a half hour an hour two hours like you'll be playing that game very very quickly so just yeah, in general just, i wanted it's to it's somewhere it's definitely between you know it sits in that space that's between it's harder to pick up than netflix is yeah but uh, yeah it's it's definitely easier to pick up than like you know writing music starting a band with your with your buddy right uh so i would even argue that some tvs are more complicated than video games yeah for real (laughs) for sure cool all right so let's see oh gosh i don't want to cut any questions so we're just gonna try to blast through this one real quick here learning games is hard so like that's i mean you know in contrary to what, what we just said, yeah. uh, it still it still is fairly hard, right? Like it's still hard to start from square one. It's hard to start. It's hard to teach someone starting from square one. And when you want to just relax and play games, teaching or learning can seem like a monumental task. So, uh, you know, we, we've talked about some of the ways to make it easier. But what would you say are some growth milestones that you think are like, hey, because I think that's another a good strategy is to sort of highlight growth and say, Oh my gosh, look, you've already done this, right? What do you think are some of those milestones that are like important that are both, you know, uh, someone who is someone who's learning can say, oh, I can do this now. That's awesome. And someone teaching can say, oh, you can do this now. That's awesome. What do you think some of those milestones are? Ooh, I, I was, I'll use some examples of playing Halo here in the community that I live in with some of the folks who were relatively new, not super new to gaming, but didn't really understand Halo. And so intricacies of a, like shields and what that looks like, what does that mean? Or how did you kill me by hitting me and it didn't work the other way around and like learning all of these things. Uh, I took those markers like of progress to be you're you're harder to kill than you were when I started and you are getting more kills. So kind of yes. looking at yeah. as you continuously, but that's a very, well, it, it can apply to a lot of multiplayer games. If you're playing with friends oh, regularly, right. You can say like, Smash, Oh, I can, can see you like, improving. Yep. Yeah. Even with yep. smash, you're killing more, you're harder to hit. Like you're, you're getting it. You're dodging more and you can use words of encouragement to kind of see growth milestones. You can also boil this question back down to, are you, cause 
older video games, especially the the side scrolling platformers from like the Super Nintendo days, a lot of retro game, a retro styled modern indie games do this, but the levels get harder as you progress. So the first one's always easy. And so you just keep playing until you can't get any farther. And then you get stuck and you keep playing and playing and playing. And then like you overcome something and you like learn, and you just get it and then you can keep going. And so your growth milestone would just be how far in the game are you? But a lot of story games now are, don't really have that, difficulty escalation curve it's more flat and it's just sure, kind of or, like but you can even say like, if they get mechanics. through if they get through a mission you know let's say it's any platformer where you die right or or even like last of us where you can you know your character can die uh you could say like oh look you you did that without dying right or yeah. hey you, yep. you 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 pulled off that stealth move perfectly right or you like uh, with my wife i was i was able to you know uh we got to that third person shooter section of the game and I had the like Gatling gun. I had the spray and pray gun. I even told her, I was like, do you want to swap? Because like my gun is easier. She was like, no, I insist. And she got yeah. really good at sniping. Like she got yeah. really good at sniping, like enviably. Good. I was like, whoa. So, you know, just being able to highlight like, hey, you nailed that shot perfectly. That was exactly what I needed you to do in that moment. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, that kind of thing is, is uh, can help them realize that, oh yeah, I am improving. Right. Cause sometimes it's so hard to see the forest for the trees. You just sit there and say, this is so hard. We keep losing or failing or dying. But then if they are able, if you're able to highlight like, no, you actually did that perfectly. You know, we screwed up because of me or we screwed up because you didn't expect this other thing. Right. That that's always really good to mm-hmm. kind of highlight. So yeah, cool. Awesome. This last question. Yeah, we have time for it. Let's just, let's, let's really quickly ask. So, you know, obviously we talked about how there's all these assumptions that the games themselves make. It's, I will just stop short of saying it's as close as you can get to built in gatekeeping, right? Like if it's, if it's preventing, if just in the lack of intuitive historical knowledge of games, it prevents people from playing, then it's kind of a form of gatekeeping. So do you think that the gaming industry should start to take a serious look at how, game culture and design has this kind of gatekeeping and instead do you think they should work to refine systems that best enable newcomers to learn and what you know, if, if you could imagine it what are some of those systems that you think would be would be beneficial to implement for games that would help newcomers learn that's built into the game itself oh the gaming industry has been doing this since forever i mean i wouldn't say yeah, like should I'm they sure. start taking a serious look like mario no, one you're right from miyamoto the first level one one was designed to move a player through the level based on enemy placement and what question mark blocks are, where the holes are placed, and the stairs is all like a tutorial level without actually saying it is. Um, and so that's game design. It's mechanics. And 90%... Yeah, you've always said uh, that, but my son yeah. still has such a hard time figuring out how to get past that first yeah, Goomba it, in Mario. You know, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you need to learn, though. You can't play any more Mario if you don't know how to jump on or over no, I a Goomba. It. I mean, like, you're done. three, but I definitely yeah. just let him just die to the goomba over and over again yeah yeah that's it yeah, let them run in the hole okay or not run and try to jump and miss the whole it, yeah it's a whole thing but games have become so much better at level design and mechanics where you're slowly introduced to things you're not usually dropped in the middle of i think of all the different types of shooters and action adventure games like with uncharted oh, I think that can be sometimes hook. right i was gonna say that can be frustrating sometimes to veterans because it's like sometimes you don't even get like the cool guns until like the last two levels of the game and you're like well mm, yeah. that's a cool gun right like i wish i could play yeah. with that more that's why breath of the wild was pretty you know it was kind of a flip on the head they like give you all the tools at the beginning and then you get to use those tools in more mm-hmm. and more elaborate ways but there was throughout. a breath of the wild we love breath of the wild we talk about it on every episode of our show uh the every plateau at the beginning which yep. <laughs> yeah, there's like a 10 hour what like maybe five to ten hour like plateau at the beginning you can't go off you can't go farther than this and you have these tools here they are and all four sections of the plateau highlight each tool individually teaching the player how to use them and then when you're done, you get the thing the, to run to, to go explore the rest of the world because you've learned the base mechanics. And most even the like what I would call like a shallow game like Battlefield, there's always a single player tutorial, like some sort of like small little campaign or like some sort of shooting range that can teach you basic stuff like how to throw a grenade, how to re- how to reload, what different healers and engineers and vehicles, how to drive them, etc. are. So I think 
I think the industry is doing a really good job. And we've seen, of course, Microsoft taking the helm with accessibility and how in, in PlayStation is doing an amazing job with its accessibility features. In fact, highlighting God of War Ragnarok, uh, there was a teaser that was all their accessibility stuff. And Last of Us Part Two, there was like 70 different choices and winning awards for the most accessible game. <laughs> just to like, although you know, like the scrolling through a menu of 70 things might not necessarily it's, be the most intuitive to newcomers. Well, yeah, I know. But, but, no, um, but you know, yeah, I go It is allowing well, newcomers to to approach like if you're colorblind before you were gatekeeped out of everything because nothing had any colorblind yeah, settings true. and so no, you couldn't see the stuff it's so. certainly a uh, a step forward well i think that you know i do think you're right you're well you're absolutely right this is something the gaming industry has realized is a problem it's it's pushing people away from games or it previously was so they are implementing it to try to draw more people into games who may have never played before or mm-hmm. have other barriers preventing them from enjoying games I think that they there is a lot of other things that they're just not thinking about though, right? Like I, I think of like what about like a newcomer mode where it does things like it gives you the option to do the tutorial every time you fire up the game over again, right? Like I know that you can always go find the tutorial, but like again, that's not necessarily intuitive to a newcomer. So having a prompt that pops up and says, like, are you a new like uh, being able to enable a mode? Are you a newcomer? Or are you have you played games before? And then if you choose newcomer, then like every time they fire it up, do you need a reminder of how the controls work? Yes or no? Uh, but even things like sort of a, a, a sort of as the game learns, like based on how much you might be failing, it might be able to learn like, oh, it seems like you're having trouble with jumping. Would you like some features that assist with this? And and those features could be things like, you know, for my wife, it's like you could give a haptic a rumble every time you need to press the jump, like when it would be the optimal time to press the jump to extend your jump. Right. Mm-hmm. If that seems to be what she's failing at, the games could like implement sort of, I guess, A.I., to realize that and then try to assist with it. Yep. And I think I imagine that with the elaborate, like as we're getting more elaborate haptic feedbacks, even being able to like somehow indicate the nuance of like what exact button they should be pushing. Right. Yeah. Uh, from like a, like a, like a, like, Oh, that button vibrates and the rest of the controller doesn't. Okay. I need to hit that. Right. There's a lot they could be doing with like haptics. Um, and also just like the sort of picture and picture tutorials and stuff that would really, mm-hmm. I think, and then just simplifying the menus for newcomers to make it so that it's easier to get to the tutorials. There are so many games that, again, Last of Us, amazing. So many accessibility features, but you have to scroll through menu upon menu upon menu just to find it. And it's like, it, yeah, yep. it's it, there's 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 sort of an assumption there that people are going to do that in the first place, as opposed to be like, screw this, I can't find what I'm looking for, I'm out, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's definitely, I think there's still some work to do. And I'm not saying they haven't taken a serious look at it, because you're absolutely right, they have. But there's still, I think, assumptions they make because most of the people that make games play them (laughs) and have been playing them for years. And so the same assumptions that we have as gamers, they have when making the games. So it's like, Mm -hmm. how do you get people in to go in and like help you figure out what are those what are those uh, pain points? So, whoo. It's a lot. It's so much. This is so yeah. long. I mean, gosh, we could have broken this up into three parts, just this topic. So, yep. <laughs> um, uh, so great. That's uh, that's where we'll stop. We want to hear what your thoughts are, listeners. What are your experiences, either teaching games or learning games for the first time? How old were you when you first learned how to play games? Who was it that maybe got you into games? Um, or are you one of those rare people who are listening to this podcast and or maybe a category one game or person, not sorry, category one non-gamer who has no interest in playing games whatsoever. We want to hear what your perspective is as well and why you're listening to this episode. I genuinely am curious. That would be fascinating to know why someone would want to do that. So, yep, go to all the places Termite will tell you to share your thoughts. I want to hear all the stories you grabbed a controller out of someone's hands and how well that went for you. And you can let me know. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> at 80bitpodsmash.com, 80bit eighty bit podsmash.com. That's our landing website with a link to all of our social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, Twitter, as well as our Discord server. Uh, and we have all of our, if you're listening to us by way of as a friend or if you saw our audio being posted to youtube which it does every week and you want to know where you can get us on your phone or podcast feed of your choice you also have links to spotify google play apple podcast as well as the rss feed to throw it into any uh, app of your choice uh our episodes go live every monday at midnight uh at worst on monday at some point during the day you can stay on our social media feeds to stay up to date on those things but yeah that's every week let's do it all right next week will be part three of this which is what change can you bring if you are a non-gamer getting into gaming what will that look like for the rest of us and and for yourself i guess so yep 
that will be part three and looking forward to digging into that next week which for us will be in like five minutes woo <laughs> see you next week <laughs>